tell everyone this what has happened here today. Take. This is our third take, but not us. Still standing up, a, but sitting down. And we are, but we're still standing up through thick and thin. Who's thick and thin? Interruptions. We've there's people bonded. that walk We've in. Trauma bonded. There's walk in. There's penises going through the shot. I mean, there's been all sorts of things have happened. All right. But you're seeing us kind of. We've already had our warm up, basically. Yeah. Instagram Live has watched us, but it is called still standing up, and it is about resilience. Yes. Metaphorically symbolically and that's what's been going on here yeah. is we've had these hiccups that have gone on and but neither one of us are bothered by it no because we've been in this industry for so long <laughs> if that if that bothered us we would definitely not yeah it. isn't it crazy when you think about it when you were growing up did you have any thoughts that this is what you would do no i definitely did not want to be a stand-up comic i tell a lot of i mean i've told this story many times and i'm gonna tell it again uh because that's what we do we yeah. repeat stories <laughs> uh, no i didn't i never wanted to be a stand-up comic even when i started doing stand-up i still didn't want to be a stand-up comic <laughs> i was an actor i wanted to be an actor um, okay. i was musical theater acting i got out of college i'm from jersey so i was right outside of manhattan so i was doing everything in new york and there was a school out there that had a school in Los Angeles. So we came out here for a week to do auditions. And back in those days, it was like do a comedic monologue and a dramatic monologue for producers. And I, you know, was doing a comedic monologue. And From what? I, mean, I don't even remember. Some play that I probably. Yeah, it was a play. It was a play. Just that's people understand. You're not doing Rodney Dangerfield's right, no. I Get No Respect no, monologue. No, you're, you're not definitely doing not that, not that monologue or like a late not monologue. You're doing something from a play or yeah, a television show. Yeah, yeah, so I did this comedic monologue. And at the end, this producer, casting director, whoever was getting paid to be there and give us notes, asked me if I did comedy. And I was 24 years old. And of course, I was like, I can do anything. Like, I thought he was offering me a job. He was like, no, I do, do yeah. stand-up comedy. You have really good timing. And mm. I was like, and I said, well, what's timing? <laughs> he's like, he goes, that's timing. He's like, you should, you should do comedy. So I went back to New York and I took a class because that's what I did at the time. Yeah. You just take classes. Comedy I took, class. I took a comedy class. Stand up class. Steven Rosenfeld. And, and he was a stand up. He was a stand up that taught a class in New York. It was like a three week class. Mm -hmm. You did a couple privates with him and then you did a show. You did a five minute yeah. show. And at that time I had already performed on stage for many years since I was a child doing musical theater. You got the chops in that I already area. knew yeah. how to be on stage. Sure. But stand up is a totally different beast. I was I was so nervous. It was at stand up New York. I was I remember thinking like when they called Jody Miller, like, who's coming on stage? Because I'm not going yeah, on stage. Yeah, yeah. I was so scared. It's nauseous. It's just, it, it, it makes you literally get nauseous, stomach. yeah. But I do believe the comedy gods bless whoever has the balls to get up on that stage. And I got up there, and I did five minutes. And I got off stage, and this woman who was, I guess, on the next show, she was a comic. Mm -hmm. She just came up to me, and she was like, you were really funny. I'd love mm. to book you no. next week. No. Oh. Now, here's the thing. No. I still didn't really know anything about how stand-up yeah, no works. No material. <laughs> so I, I five minutes. But I said to her, I go, oh, no, 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 no. I, I just had to do this for this producer in L.A. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'll see you Thursday. I'm like, what? Like, I, the fact that I had to do it again Jeez. was making me nauseous. But I kept doing it. I did it, you know, for three years in New York. Again, only to further my acting career. It was really going well in New York, but when I moved out here three years later, I was like, well, that's it for stand-up. I really want to be an actress. Yeah. I don't want to do this. So I started taking improv classes. I was in an improv group in New York, too, so I continued that out here. And one night, they were like, let's go do a see, see stand-up. Went to the LA Connection in the Valley, and they had a stand-up night. And one of the people performing was like, I remember you from New York. Hey, listen, do you want to do five minutes? And I was like, well, I guess I could still you do it. Do you believe this is Bashir to be, you know, the whole I, thing, how it all lined up? A hundred percent. At yeah. the time, I was very stubborn and I was in my 20s, so I yeah. thought I knew it all. Yeah. So I did it. And again, someone walked up to me. I believe it was Vargas Mason, who's been doing this forever, mm -hmm. came up to me, was like, I run this show. I want to book you. And again, I was like, oh, no, I really just want to be an actress. Mm -hmm. It took a very long time for me to be like, most why am I resisting? I know. I want, most people would be like so grateful. There's a saying, what you resist persists. And exactly. it, that is definitely the case with it you. It was. I finally there's something, gave in. something almost ethereal or spiritual that was pushing. It was guiding me. 100%. In this, in this direction, even 100%. though you didn't want it. No. It, where most people in stand-up want it. They have want a it. thirst for yeah. it. But you I, still have a thirst that underlying yes. theme of I want to be on a stage. That was it the just thing. can manifest itself in different ways. What I had to do, and I, this was probably the, the first, but the first of many times that I had to reframe my thinking. And I literally remember going home and changing on the computer 
my resume to um, a com uh, and a com I'm sorry, an actor who does comedy to a comedian who can act. Wow. And it yeah. is that mind shift of like, stop resisting it. Sure. That's what's flowing. Sure. And I, I've done that so many I times. I love that you said that. I actually, when I teach, I teach that genuine energy flow. And I mean, genuinely. Yes. And your energy, your energy yes. follows thought. So once you put the thought in and go, okay, now that's, I'm proclaiming that title. Yep. And then everything flows everything from there. Everything does flow. Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing, that's a great story. I love that. I hope it's Thank inspiring you. to other people. I do too. Is don't stay in a box, you know, and if somebody gives you a nudge to uh, go elsewhere, then do it. I always say, you know, people are like, you know, they try to label stand-up comedian. I don't even want to be a stand-up comedian. I'm the same way. I do not want to be labeled that. I just invented a, a food I, seriously, I invented a food concept that the, one of the top chefs in the world just jumped in as my partner. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. But the, 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 people aren't going, hey, he's a food guy. Right. You know, I actually have a food television show. It doesn't matter. And whatever inspires. I'm yes. an animated show. It doesn't matter. Yes. You're on a you're on a, a, a talk show. I mean, a, a, game, a show. game show. Well, that, then that in itself, just get going on that show, just becoming a part of that show was another example of something I had been resisting for so many years yeah. about being in a writer's room, just resisting it. Writer's rooms have a rumor, and which is actually true in a lot of them. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. And there's so many rumors. <laughs> well, the rumor is that it's really difficult because it's a, I was in a one room in particular, and it's a fight because it's a lot. people are fighting yeah. for their job. They're fighting for their job fighting the following the job. year. Right. They're, because yeah, there exactly. is no consistency. There's no stand up, you can yes. pretty much work Anywhere you want in the world, yep. you can move to somewhere and they're going to have comedy. But you can decide how much you want to get up, how little yep. you want to get up. Yeah. You can definitely pretty continue. much. Yes, I mean, you can control you your career to a point much, for sure. Yeah. And with the writer's room, I knew that the hours were long. Mm -hmm. I knew that it would be a fight, a competition. There was a lot of elements about it that I did not find appealing. So when this opportunity came with Funny You Should Ask to work on the pilots, I was really, really hesitant. And what's very interesting is that my ex... I was, I had reconnected with ex an ex. what? Boyfriend, ex -boyfriend husband. An okay. ex-boyfriend that I had reconnected. He's a comedian? No, he is not. Don't say it like that. Oh, I meant it, I meant it in a really, I meant it in a very positive way. But I also Your hands meant, went up like, I, like no, surrender. I meant, I meant it like, no, he is not, and thank God he is not. Uh, okay, I was yes. reading into it yes. properly. No, 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 yeah. You know, I um, am a stand-up comedian, so it was a little offensive. No. <laughs> don't, don't okay. touch. Don't come near me. Don't you touch me. Uh, no, this is, come get it. Uh, I must say to the audience that uh, stand-up comedians are a different breed, mm -hmm. and uh, I can see why you would say that. Yes. I uh, never dated a comedian have, all my career until I've recently. Even, oh, I've never dated And I'm comedian. still not dating that person, right. but it was, you know, right. somewhat of whatever. It's and, very difficult. And, well, yeah, uh, when, if you go, if that's the thing is, uh, we we're talking about earlier, is the labeling is, I actually, even in that department, I don't like to label, because why would I do that in that area if I'm not doing it artistically? Right. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you're a comic. I can't date you. I mean, right. it's, you know, it's pretty prejudicial. Right. But I understand. <laughs> okay. Definitely not. But I want you to watch this. Oh, stuff I, I put it in me. slow I do, motion I when I see you. I do this a lot yeah. with my hands. Trust me. <laughs> like, stop in the, stop. Name, in the name of the law. Please. So, um, but anyway, he's somebody that he wasn't in the industry at all, has never been. So what was interesting is that he's given me He's actually changed the course of my life twice in this industry. Wow. And that's what was very interesting. He's literally come into my life twice and changed mm. the course of it. The first time was when I did comedy. I came back from that trip from L.A. And I was ready to actually pack up and move to L.A. Because this guy told me <laughs> that I have good timing. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll take a class in L.A. And I'll be near this guy. This is not the boyfriend, though. No. But okay. I was dating him at the time. And I told him the story and? about what happened. And he selfishly was like you can't move to LA like we just started dating he sure. goes and there's the a comedy's huge in New York obviously why wouldn't you just take a class here so he was with me when we found the class that kept me in New York for another oh, three years oh, now him and I ended after my comedy was already like flowing about eight months later sure. and I didn't need him anymore then we recorrect reconnected 20 years later I'm in LA, he's there, we started a long distance thing, he would fly out every couple of weeks, and I had the interview for the writing position for the pilots to the game show, and I wasn't going, to, I don't think, I was really on the funny fence. Shoot, funny funny you should, should ask. ask. Yeah. I remember thinking like, 
oh my God, so the pilots, I've, you know, I haven't been in a writer's room like this, I don't know, and we went out to dinner, and I just kept talking about him, like, it's gonna be really long hours, these are the hours, I don't know what, you know, I don't know if this is the right move. Again, somebody did not- Did you have your daughter at the time? No, I did not. And oh, so that wasn't even a factor. No, it wasn't even a factor. It was already a difficult decision on I how just, long yes. the hours how Well, long it was the, the hours, hours are, you know, yeah. you're used to your own schedule, sure. performing, yeah. Yeah. and I was like, I'm, I don't, and he just out loud was like, I think you should do it. He, knew, he knows nothing about this industry, nothing about a writer's room, nothing. He's in pharmaceuticals, nothing. <laughs> and he goes, I think you should do it. And I said to him, I go, you don't understand. My entire life would change. That's exactly what I said. And he goes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I called up Scott Satin, who was the EP at the time. I called him up and I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. And cut to, you know, we just wrapped our seventh season and I am now the executive producer and Crazy. I'm the on-air talent on the show and my entire life changed. Yeah. So he changed the course of my life twice and it's very funny. So hopefully, you know, in another 20 years, he'll come on in and do it again. And you'll marry him. <laughs> <laughs> um, has, he, has he come back to you and no, said, No, we ended it very, very, we ended it very and so soon for after sure and you guys he are got done. remarried. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's, oh, okay. It's, it was one of those things where he was getting divorced. We reconnected. It was, you know, really great for a few months. We sort of, I think I had to have closure on the original yeah. relationship. And of course, he was meant to be in my life to steer me in this direction. I have a non sequitur, but Let's and we'll it. get back to this. Oh, yeah. Were you on the Pete Holmes, that show on HBO? Were you on that show? Yeah, I did um, an episode of Crashing. I mean, not Crashing. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, no, that roll, was it. Roll with, no, no, I was not on Crashing. I was on um, How We Roll. Oh, right? okay. Yeah, the one on CBS. Oh, okay. Just one episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I think I remember you from that. Yeah. That's how much you stand out with those hazel eyes. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey. <laughs> I have hazel eyes too. You do have hazel eyes. Yours are more <laughs> green. Yeah, striking yeah. green. Thank anyway, you. anyway, so you yes. ended up on Funny Should Ask. Now, are they? They're aware of it's basically Hollywood Squares. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. But, but what? That, I mean, what a great! It's just a great format, and these, you know, it is a great are, format. These comics are amazing. I love working with. I was on OG Hollywood Squares. You were seventy-five. Times, oh my god, yeah. it's amazing. For me, it was like a, it was a dream. And I'll t this is what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Is do you realize, and I'll get to why, the effect you have? Do you ever think about that? The effect you have on like children watching that are seeing you on television? Do you ever like step back and realize that you are the celebrity that they're looking at? And like I can name every Hollywood square that, I ever, that ever existed, you know, yeah. from when I was a kid. Yeah. I can tell you where they were. I can tell you where Rose Marie was and right. Paul Lynn. And That's Paul Lynn, I wrote him letters to fix him up with my mother. He's the best. He, so, the best. So he could be my dad. And, and <laughs> I mean, so uh, Charlie Weaver to block and uh, uh, Wally Cox. So when I was in the squares, there was this moment of, oh my God. You're in squares. I'm in a damn square. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously Paul Lynn, my father's not alive anymore, but, uh, <laughs> but. It's. Do you ever think about that when when you're, don't, uh, actually, when you're you on know, television? You don't go. There are people watching me right now that know who I am. They know my name. They want to know more about me. They they might love me and all that stuff. You don't think about that. You know what it is because I'm. You know I think this is a trait that a lot of performers have. A lot of people in this industry, unless you're at at a very very high level, is. I just don't think of myself as the celebrity, a celebrity, someone people. I just don't, because especially. I'm gonna say I'm gonna sound the same way. Because, yeah. but also yeah, yeah. nowadays too, things are totally different. Everyone's a star, and no one's a star. Yeah. With social media, with influences, with influencers. So there's, you know, there are TikTok stars or YouTube stars that the majority of people that we know had never heard of them, but they make millions of dollars yeah. and are, you know, very well known by their peers. Yeah. It's everything is different now. So I don't think about it. I do, though, think about the effect I have, you know, when I make someone laugh or when somebody says like, you're hilarious or I love watching you or I mm -hmm. love your comedy. That to me is like that's I got to, I got to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the yeah. best. Yeah. That's what keeps us in this game. I mean, you know, this is called Still Standing Up. Truth is, is that I've been knocked down so many times, as I'm sure you have. We've heard them already today. You've had four knockdowns. <laughs> I mean, those no, are just baby Not, not necessarily those knockdowns. Those are just pushes. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah, those are pushes in stumbles different directions and, yes, and stumbles. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's what 
you know, that's why we have this show is to give people an opportunity to hear stories that give them faith and hope that they can turn something around that seems so bleak 100%. and desperate. And we've been there. We've been there. And here you are. You are. And by the way, let's note, which you haven't done, that you're a female in a pretty male dominated business. It is. It's definitely especially gotten. Especially in your role. It definitely, yes. It's definitely a little bit, it's opened up oh, yeah. a lot more, a lot more opportunities. But the good thing about that, the good thing about all of this. By the way, it's opened up so much that people tell me literally do not apply for anything. Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> Being I a mean, white yeah. male. Oh, yeah. Oh, they tell me, don't even don't buy. Don't even. They tell me serious? flat out. They would say, they, you cannot even apply for that job. Wow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about executive positions. And, and no, you will not. <laughs> even with your 23andMe, 14% yeah. African, you will not. You will not. <laughs> you're not, you're be, not that. You will not be coming into this room because it, people literally have a diversity quotient. Oh, yeah, no. I'm I sure you do as well. Well, no, I mean, show. actually, our show is, you know. It's already diverse. We really, we really. I, to be honest with you, when looking at writer's packets, for the most part, it's like I would love to see a blind – like it has to be like a blind – I just want to read the packet first before I know anything yeah. about it. Because we want the best writers, obviously, but we really try to, you know – we we really – we try to be diverse and especially with – you know, for me with women, seeing, you know, female mm -hmm. comedy writers is just such a joy. The, the if there's is, a tie between a white male and a female, the female is going to get it. I mean, I'm not going to say that. Honestly, look I, at me. I, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, it, it hasn't come to that. We haven't ever had that decision. Not a tie. There's never no, a tie. Is there's not. There's somebody a, always a clear winner. There's and a clear winner. And a packet looks like what? For our show, we're it's, sending you, you know, a packet. we're sending you a sample packet. We want you to send back, you know, 20, 25 sample questions and jokes. And, and then if we like you again, then we talk to you. And then you have, you know we do it again, like a turn, a quick turnaround to see how you can do it, you know, in 24 hours, that type of thing. And that's what a lot of writer's packets look like. Um, yeah. You're not, you're not reading a script for a, a new sitcom that they created. No. But you're I writing mean, a, you're yeah. reading. But those questions are really, you know, it's interesting. This was something that I didn't know I could even do. It's a different type of comedy writing yeah. compared to what we write when we get on stage. Absolutely. So it's definitely a skill. It's not even it, like, I don't know about your act. I, I make mine very personal. Mine too. So those jokes are very rarely personal. They're yeah, because, absolutely. Um, yeah, they're very observational, yeah. and which you know works. Observational comedy is obviously very huge. We we all do it on stage. It's coming from our personal point of view, yes. but everybody can relate to that. And, it, and the good thing is that everybody can relate to our personal stories too. Because I'm if I'm talking about my mom, who died, there are people in the audience who have lost a loved one. <laughs> Doesn't even yeah. have to be a parent. Everybody can relate yeah. to something that you are talking about. Yeah. When I, I teach stand up as well, when I'm working with someone or I'm coaching someone, I'm like, nothing's off the table. You think you're talking about something that nobody can relate to? I guarantee you, someone in the audience can. Even if you're talking about something hyper specific, like a type of cancer or some type of disease, someone in the audience has has dealt with an illness, a disease. Like I'm, I guarantee you, you're talking about. Yeah, it's a, a, it's yeah. a feeling that you're mm -hmm. creating for people, and that people in the audience are going, "Oh, geez, I felt like that before. I never want to feel like that again. Absolutely. Oh my God, that's embarrassing," or whatever it is. You're bringing that to them to that space, and it's a space of relatability, and there's yep. a connection that takes place, absolutely, like no other, like no other. It is something. Even music, I yeah. don't think there, there's, there's this quite. I don't think it goes to this level because we're talking about stuff that a lot of, most people can't talk about, and when you talk about it, that's why they say you know comedy is cheaper than therapy. I think my favorite quote ever is, "You can spend ten years on the couch or ten minutes on stage." Yeah, and it's so true. So yeah. we're talking about it. It's healing for us, especially if it's mm -hmm. something that is a traumatic experience. We're dealing with it, but we're helping other people. Like when I was trying to get pregnant and I couldn't get pregnant and I was talking about all of that stuff. And obviously it's funny, but I would have women come up to me. I'm trying to get pregnant. Mm. I had a miscarriage. I did this. I did mm. that. You know what I mean? And it was, they felt like, oh, I'm not alone. And not only am I not alone, she found a way to make it funny. And when you, when you add the humor to it, you sort of take the power away from that mm. big, bad, terrible, you know, thing that happened. And it sort of loses its power. And you, like I've worked with a lot of veterans using comedy, you know what I mean, yeah. to, to heal. Talking about traumatic events, just just in therapy, but actually adding humor to it definitely removes some of that power and helps you to process it. So it's just, it's 
beneficial on all the levels. And now that I talk about my daughter and adopting her and all of that, I get a lot of people, I adop I'm adopted, we're trying to adopt, you know, your experience, mm. I feel like, you know, it's all, it's all wonderful Tell stuff. Tell us how that, how that unfolded, your adopted daughter. I, I hear the first step was you tried to get pregnant. I tried to get pregnant. And, uh, by the way, solo or did you have a partner? I just fucked a whole bunch of dudes without <laughs> protection. I mean, like, what else are you going to do? Well, you right? know, comedy's timing. Where's my timing in that? <laughs> Where's my timing when you were on that role? What do you, I, I actually, one time I volunteered to give the uh, sperm to a, a lesbian couple. And? And I told them, I said, I would rather not go into a beaker or whatever, <laughs> into a tube. Yep. I'd rather, you know, do this naturally. And they said no. Uh, it just didn't work out. You could have actually just, you know, because I, there was a lot of uh, research on this and I did have a friend who also wanted to volunteer. You could have, yeah, you could have just done it into a cup and they could have literally taken it from one room. If you, it can, it stays alive for 30 minutes oh, every temperature. Yeah, oh, so yeah. you could have just carried it on over. But you really well, I, I did that also with a wife too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we had to do the injections. And oh, yeah, all of that said, stuff. They said treat her like an orange and you put the needle in there. And I, I remember all that stuff. And then they put you in a room. Yes. And give you the worst pornography <laughs> you've ever seen. I'm literally looking at the porn going, these people are dead now. Uh, that yeah. I masturbating to. Yes, but you did. But giant you bushes. <laughs> but you were able to finish, right? No, it was rough. It was. I remember though, honestly, really see, tough. I was still sing. I was single. I was trying to do it on my own. I just didn't want this opportunity. You were doing that on your own. I was doing that. It. Would not have worked. Well, I was masturbating into a cup. I don't think you could have done. I that. tried. No, uh, there wasn't a cup. Um, there was better porn. No, but I had a. Sper I would you know buy sperm at a sperm bank, and I remember walking into the clinic one time with my like cryogenically frozen sperm that used in a big tank and you walk in and I see all these couples sitting there and this guy clearly came out of a room with a specimen like holding yeah. a bag and we're comics you can't just not was he hot he was okay <laughs> but I literally said to him I'm like you got any extra <laughs> and nobody except for the nurses found that funny the nurses laughed I was like come on I'm like you can't use all of that not all of it um, it's millions so many you can, you can spare it it's so like, many it's, <laughs> he had we're, all, we're, we're all Elon Musk seriously <laughs> when come it comes on. to sperm I am I Elon want Musk. You want a baby? Come on, let's work it I'm out. I'm Jeff Bezos. You, you want some? You want some of this? You, they're, and they're good swimmers. They could be on both let's teams. Do it. So. Anyway, that didn't work out. I didn't get pregnant. Uh, Love my fertility doctor. It didn't work out. And then I got on America's Got Talent. Same segue into yeah. America's Got Talent. I got on America's Got Talent, so I stopped with the hormones. I stopped with everything, and because I was like, well, that's why I didn't get pregnant because I was supposed to be on America's Got Talent, and then that was a very strange beautiful amazing horrific experience and then afterwards when i went back to my fertility doctor everything had changed in my body it was getting a little older i'd been on a military tour mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that sure. had changed so i didn't want to be any more aggressive especially on my own and i'd already spent thousands of dollars so i kind of tens of thousands I, so much money oh, so yeah, i put a pin in it i was like hold on i get on you know i start working at funny should ask I had a lot of friends that had adopted, and I decided, okay, this is what I was going to do. I was going to adopt. So, you know, adoption lawyer, adoption mm. agency. Again, as a single person, yeah. it takes a little bit longer because when you try to match with a birth mom or birth parents, they look at packets. I wonder if, I wonder if you went to the same place I did for my adopted child. Is your child adopted? Did I know? One that? of them. I have oh. four. One of them is. Okay. Um, Adopt help. No, I no. went to. You know them? Uh, no, I went to Your Vista Delmar. Like lawyers. Okay. And then David Radis is okay. my um, adoption lawyer. And they handle everything. Yeah. Which is mm -hmm. amazing. Which well, see, my my lawyer was the best because he actually found the baby. So like yeah. the the agency is in California, and then my lawyer you know scours the country, and so you matched with the birth mom, birth parents. She chose. She chose she you. She chose me because uh, she wanted a sense of humor for a child. Isn't I think that crazy? that's why I was chosen as well. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And because they do have a choice, yes. and they. So la that's what. How they many told me. did you guys have? Like several months to like. What was the? If you really want to know, I do because it's, well, a, it's a crazy story. I'll tell it very briefly. I was on a radio show, and I'm a psychic actually, and I know you don't know that. I'm literally a psychic. I, I see clients and everything else, but I had a psychic. My master. Not allowed to use that word anymore. My guy, my guide, he was a, uh, he's an amazing psychic, Hans King. I called him Hans King, the real thing. And we we're on the radio show, and he said, "I see a, 
a soul is calling for you in a blue blanket. And I, of course, I'm a comic. I go, don't you have to have sex? He goes, no, he goes, no, no, just stay available. And I learned how to stay available in life. Next day, I got a letter from this fan. And she says, I want you to have this child, blah, blah, blah. So I went to this place, Adopt Help, which was down the street. I walked down there with my biological son and my wife at the time. And we went down there and they said, okay, we'll handle this. But are you available for another one? I said, Hans told me to stay available. A week later, I said, she's not going to work out, but we found you a match. Flew her out here put a spy on her kind of thing. They say what, well, they say what she's really like and put her up in an apartment and everything. Yeah. And, uh, three and a half weeks from when he said that baby and who looks just like there's no one that ever says that an adopted child. It's crazy. I love it. How about, how about your daughter? Is it, is there so, any resemblance? Yeah. People think, uh, that she looks like me. I think she mimics my facial expressions. So, uh, oh, wow. You that's know, a hell of a mimic. I know. Good. <laughs> does she do this? Uh, she does that. Oh, by the way, all the time. She's, she's three. She's three. So that's all Holding she does. Hold up to both hands. No, mommy. No. I don't want that. I want that. Um, oh, jeez. My story is... The yeah, double halt hands. She's double halt hands. <laughs> she's... It's equally as crazy. My... You know, I was in the system and everything, and it was, a year, it was over a year. I remember it was during mm. the pandemic, and I had reached out to my lawyer, and, wow. and, and I wasn't getting nearly as many possibilities sent, sent to me as compared to like my married friends that were also, you know, waiting, they would get like five or six, you know, options a week to submit their packet to. And I was doing a podcast on a Sunday and I was wrapping up the podcast and I got a text and an email at the same time from my lawyer. Great, great possibility. Submit your packet. I don't think I read, it, it was, it's like an audition. You send everything in and then you forget about it. But I don't think I really read the email that was like the baby was born like hours before. Anyway, I send everything in and forget about it because I, there's nothing. I was like, I was actually trying to plan. I was working with a surrogate that I was going to go in that direction because I really oh, wanted to be a parent. Yeah. And I had also been to a psychic right before who actually saw a baby coming in February. And I mm. thought the surrogate's going to work out. This is when it's going to mm. happen. But he actually, he saw my daughter. Anyway, I, it's like, it's like a, he said February, like but my daughter was born on January 31st. So I got her in February. It's like going into Manhattan from New Jersey. You just took a different tunnel. I took it. Exactly. I took her tunnel. Did you know how many babies came out of her tunnel? 13. No way. Her tunnel is busy. Her tunnel is like the Holland. No, her tunnel is the Lincoln Tunnel. The it's Lincoln. a little bit yeah, busier. Well, most... Holland's pretty busy, but Lincoln, yeah, yeah. definitely not the bridge. I've been definitely stuck not more in Lincoln than I have. Me too. Not Always. that I've ever been. Not to be the Holland Tunnel. Um, but no, so I was sitting on the couch yeah. Sunday evening eating a bowl of whipped cream, watching Gilmore Girls, mm -hmm. and I see that my lawyer is calling. And the first thought, the first thing I thought was, oh, the file didn't go through. That PDF is massive, and that's happened before when mm. I go to send my packet. Yeah. So I answer it. I go, hey, David. And there was a very strange silence on the phone. And then he said, you were selected. Mm. And I said, for what? I really had no, it just didn't. I was like, what do you do? And he mm. goes, your baby was born this morning. You need to get on a plane mm. tomorrow in the middle of a pandemic and go to Kentucky. And then oh. I lost like the hearing for a second. I was like, and then I got I was up. about to say, I'm a little choked up now. Did you break down in tears? You know what? I didn't break down in tears. Really? Until, until, so now. Oh my God, you So stiff. obviously my, so, well, no, it's because you're in shock. Honestly. I'm just kidding. No, I know. You're in shock. You're Absolutely. in shock. Of course you know that feeling. So but, I'm actually post shock and into tears. So yes, you're into tears. But what happened There's was. some breakdown my that takes knee, place. It's so. My knee-jerk reaction was, this isn't my baby. This isn't my, it was too fast. I didn't have any time to prepare. You Like, your baby's born already. I thought I was going to have a couple months. I thought we were going to put her up in a hotel. I thought it was going to do that. Right. So I didn't know what to do, so I called my dad. Color the right color in the room. and I didn't know what, I didn't, yeah. there was nothing. So yeah. I called my dad. My dad also had the same knee-jerk reaction. He's like, wait a minute. Weren't you thinking about working with a surrogate? You don't know anything about this mom. I was like, okay, all right, let me just get to Kentucky. We'll figure it out. Because my lawyer told me, it's like, submitting is not committing. You can go there, whatever. She was in the NICU. Mm. She's a preemie. She was also, you know, born with meth in her system. She's healthy. Don't worry. Anybody that's seen my special knows. Um, mm -hmm. She's, you know, fine. I get to Kentucky. I Meanwhile, I'm throwing up on the airplane. I, I'm, I was going through a sort you're of like, throwing I was up. throwing up. As I was going you're... through with like a sort of labor. <laughs> I was like the nerves, everything. I get mm. there. It was pandemic time, so I couldn't bring anyone with me. Ooh. I was by myself wearing a mask. I get up to the NICU. They're checking everything. At this point, I actually felt like I was going to pass out. It was just so much anticipation. This nurse walks me down the very long hallway. I walk into a NICU room. 
It's a huge room, actually. The hotel, the hospital was amazing. The hotel. Mm-hmm. Um, I walk in, and there is my daughter, so tiny, four pounds seven ounces, mm, in the tiny the little. Uh, yeah, she's a preemie, six weeks early, in a tiny little incubator. Oh yeah, my that's, first son was that way. That's when I broke down. Yeah. The second I saw little her little needles little body, in their arms. She yes, but I but they did say I don't even know how they, they do were it. just testing. Like she actually didn't even they didn't know how old the mom didn't know she was pregnant. Longer story. So they didn't know exactly at that time how early she was because she was presenting a lot older. She was breathing on her own. They just kept her in the incubator to make sure she could regulate her body temperature. Of course, yeah. And she was only in there for a day, and then she was out. That's it. She wow. didn't. She was really healthy. Pre-music um, usually in there a little yeah. longer. Yeah, so than she that. was only in the NICU for 16 days, and that was also because we were waiting for the adoption and everything to go through. So I grab my baby. They, they put the baby in my arms. We do the skin on skin. I, I don't know what to feel. I'm sitting there staring at this very tiny baby, and I'm like, ah, and they're taking pictures of me. I'm like, ah, <laughs> and I'm like by myself, and I'm holding her. Oh. And, you know, she's asleep the whole time because newborns, yeah. you know. And also they can't see. They can't even – they can see, like, a foot in front of them. That's about it. Yeah. So she's in the incubator, and I remember everybody being like, tell her affirmations, tell her affirmations. So I got really, really close. She's asleep the whole time, the entire time, the two hours I was there, totally asleep. Laying down, I get really close to her little incubator face, and I go, you know, you are strong, you are smart, you are beautiful, you are healthy, you are safe, Mm. and you are loved. That's exactly what I said to her. And then, still sleeping, and then I said, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to start crying. And then right at that moment, her eyes just opened up, and we locked eyes. The first time, the uh, the entire time I was there, and mm. at that moment, m- I started crying, yeah. and I thought, yeah. "That's my baby." Yeah. And looking back on every single thing that happened, why I didn't get pregnant, all of the things, is because she was always meant to be my daughter, just waiting for her to come. And you know, sh- I you, I can't sum up this show any more than that because that is the turnaround. That is something else, another force at work. 100%. That is divine guidance. Yes. All of it. And I just want to say this to everybody watching and listening, because this is an important lesson that my daughter has taught me, my career has taught me, so many things have taught me, is that you haven't aged out of your life. You haven't aged out of becoming a parent. I was a much older mom. I didn't know if it was going to happen. I haven't, you haven't aged out of your career. You haven't aged out of anything that you still want to do. And all of these things that led me to where I'm at now has proven that like you can accomplish anything at any age, almost anything. You're not going to probably be an astronaut, but there's, you can still do everything. I just last year did give up on my hopes of, uh, being a professional football player last year. No, don't do that. I, I maybe with you being I on here, I might like give it another year. One, one more I'm year. A, I'm past coach at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Um. <laughs> so yeah, what a way to uh, conclude this, uh, which isn't concluded because it's life is ever laughed, everlasting, you know, yeah. and it's the, I'm so happy that you were here. I got to know you a little bit. Let's yes. go hang in real life. You know, yes. I, if it's such a wonderful spirit, I'm glad you shared it with us today. And I can exactly. tell that you're in that alignment and we have to show up and it to that alignment and whatever forces are telling us otherwise, don't listen. Don't listen. You know, it's uh, hard because those voices are really loud. They're voices of fear. They're, they're voices, voices of fear. They don't know any better. Even the ageist people. You're right. Those are voices of fear because they're projecting their own stuff that they're at that, that age. They can't do it or they are that age, whatever 100%. it is. They're looking into the future and it's scary for them. To, yeah. So they attack and that's the way people are. But yeah. I love your message today is, is no, no, it does not matter. The outside world doesn't matter. It's the mm-hmm. inside world exactly. that we create inside of ourselves. The only voice you should be listening to is yourself. And by the way, that is the loudest voice. And when it's in a bad place and it's telling you, it's reaffirming what you think everybody else thinks about you, that's when it's really, when you're really scared. But you have to, you have to get that voice to remember that y- you can still do it. And then once that voice is back to like, okay, we can do this. We can make this happen. We can make the, and by the way, sometimes it, a lot of times, most of the times it happens not the way you thought it was going to happen. Never, and that's, and never. That's, you thought you were going to be a musical theater. Exactly. And guess what? That's okay. That's great. 
it's great. Like, just be open. You said that yeah. in the beginning. Just be open to whatever is be, coming be, your be way. Be available to surrender. Mm -hmm. Surrender is the greatest victory. Surrender your ideas mm -hmm. on the way it should be. You probably thought you were going to be the lead in Rent. No, I didn't actually. What I did, did you think? You what, know, I what, what was, was your Broadway? What, what, I didn't want to do Broadway. I left. Bro I left singing. I you're the musical was, theater. Was, but Rent hadn't come out yet. If Rent had come out, maybe Les a couple Mis? years. Or, I didn't want to do that type of musical theater. That's oh. the thing. If Rent had come out, I probably would have stayed in that game longer. But I got my. I booked my first television role on Law and Order as mm. a juror number like five, <laughs> hung over. And I remember thinking, I want to be on TV. <laughs> like I just didn't want to, like being a singer and going to these auditions was just too much. I wanted to live yeah. in my twenties and be in New York yeah. City and have fun. And that's what I did. I have no regrets with that. <laughs> no lame is. No. That's my goal. All right, you can still do it. I still. You still have it. And I'm not aged out. You can't, I of can course. still be Javert. I see Javert all over you. Valjean, unless we see each other plain, our guest today was Jody Miller. <laughs> you are awesome. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Tell us where to find you and. Uh, you can fo follow me. Well, I don't mean literally, okay. like North Hollywood. Go to. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to be outside the studio right now for about an hour, crying about just about everything. Um, no, uh, find me at Jody Miller Comic on all social. Jody Miller Comedy. On my website, you can see where I'm performing, usually on social. And my special drops May 12th. Yes. If this is after May 12th, whatever. It's going to be on YouTube, and it's called Decades in the Making because it's been decades in the making. That's exactly right. Just like your baby, who's now three years old. She's three. I love it. Thank you, Jody, thank for you. being here. And everyone, thank you for checking us out and make sure you spread the word because we're here for you. Not only does it make you laugh, we know how to do that. You come to our shows, but... This is hopefully something that inspires. My goal is to take the spiritual realm. We're very serious, and a lot of comics are very cynical. They don't understand that the truth really is a higher source, God, whatever you want to call it. That's what telling the truth is. You can be cynical all you want. You're not an atheist. You really are. If you are a comedian, you are giving a gift to others. Yeah. And so I'm trying to build a bridge from the woo-woo to the ha-ha. <laughs> So thanks for building that bridge with me, Jody Miller. I'm the woo -woo. And, we'll just, and, and you're the ha ha, <laughs> and you're plenty of ha ha. I'll see you next time. We have to cut. We're holding. We're gonna go just to get a uh, an opening, please. A fucking gut. With, an opening without a um, gut. All right. An opening. <laughs> okay. You can do it. Do you can best. do it. I'll do my best. You haven't aged out of this opening. <laughs> thanks for bringing that one up. <laughs> That's what I'm dealing with right now. It's when are you ready? Ready? Oh, when I'm ready? Yeah. I'm ready. April. Hello, it's Craig Shoemaker with Still Standing Up, and our special guest today is Jody Miller. What a great guest this is. She has been, you might recognize her from America's Got Talent. Me and my family, we watch that show all the time. Rooting for the comedians, never won yet. But I'm a winner right now because I've got Jody Miller in the house. Great. One more, please. Oh, please make Mix it up. Mix it up. <laughs> hey, it's Craig Shoemaker still standing up, sitting down right now with Jody Miller, our famous guest. I'm very happy to have her. I can't wait to get to it, and I'll bet you you can't wait to hear it. Terrific. If you can do uh, closing, please, and mention her special. Okay. Not dated. Okay. Yes. Jody, thank you for being here and being our guest. I can't wait to see your special. It's called Decades in the Ma Making. Yes, and you can find it on YouTube, and Decades in the Making. And it's a literal title. It's been... Yeah. Decades. decades, decades. And if you believe in past lives, centuries in the centuries making. Centuries in the making. <laughs> I have a feeling that she was Tody Fields in another life. <laughs> I was. I had that to come person, up with some that reference. That was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> she had one leg. <laughs> anyway, uh, hope you enjoy.